Thanks a lot, Michel. Uh, so welcome again, everybody, to Milton Keynes Central Library from me. Um, as you've been told, I'm Kevin McConway. Um, actually, I'm the Emeritus Professor of Applied Statistics <laughs> at the Open <laughs> University, which means I retired a couple of years ago, and that gives me more time to deal with things like, like uh, this. And I'm going to be chairing tonight's event. Uh, well, I, you know, stati statistics, it doesn't sound like it's terribly relevant to this stuff. I, I hope you'll find out that actually it is. Uh, but I do wear various other hats as well, but I'm not going to bore you with that because I'm not the main attraction here. These two are. Um, first of all, we're going to have a talk from Anna Berry, who was responsible for that marvellous um, artwork that I guess you've all looked at out there. Um, and then Jason Hickel, who's an academic anthropologist and author. And I'll say a bit more about Jason later on. They're going to each speak for about 25 minutes, and then there'll be time for a question and answer session and discussion afterwards where you uh, can join in. Um, OK, I'll say a bit more about Jason before he, he actually speaks, but now let me introduce Anna to you. Um, so this session was billed as the constantly moving happiness machine, artist and academic. Anna Berry is the artist involved. Anna Berry is an artist who's been based in Milton Keynes for several years now, uh, but people do like to know about origins, so I'll say a little bit about that. Anna's originally from the west of Scotland, uh, and since this event's academic as well as artistic in nature, perhaps I'll tell you that one of the things she did between leaving the west of Scotland and ending up in Milton Keynes was to study philosophy and psychology at the University of Oxford, which is perhaps not the most common background for a, a visual artist, but there you are. Um, Anna's artistic work has always been strongly politically engaged. Most of it's project-based, and it tends to consist of installations and interventions of various kinds, of which you've seen one out there. Sometimes that's done in art galleries. More often, it's done in other places, in and out of doors. Uh, just as one example, um, Anna has done very interesting artworks in underpasses in Milton Keynes. If you're from Milton Keynes, you'll know how many underpasses there are. Um, the work is often, by its very nature, temporary. And um, often the work's based, you know, like the work out there, the work uses paper, often repurposed paper in various ways, as a material. Anna's work exploits the relationship between reality and experience. And Anna looks at that in a particular way. And it draws ideas from a very wide range of ways of thinking, you know, just some of them, philosophy, economics, political and cultural theory, physics, and there's a whole lot more. Um, Anna's work's been shown at the Tate Modern in London and also at the South Bank. Um, and as well as appearing in the United Kingdom, her work's been exhibited in Venice, in the USA, in, in Iceland, and in Bulgaria. And she's had several <laughs> international residencies in the USA and Iceland. And I should say that Anna's work doesn't only consist of installations involving paper. In particular, she's got an important portfolio as a photographer that helps with the installations in making a long-term record of these sometimes uh, ephemeral and um, short-term pieces of work. But it goes much broader than that. And just on a kind of personal note, it's not terribly relevant tonight. Uh, Anna is also an excellent musician. She has an absolutely marvellous voice. I know her because we used to sing in a choir together some years ago. So, Anna Berry. Thank you. Entirely embarrassed there. That was much more than I thought. The whole origin story was like, <laughs> wow. Okay, hello, lovely people. Thank you so much for being here. Um, ah, yes, really pleased that there's so many people in Milton Keynes interested in this event. Um, I am going to make this a little bit more red than I would like to. I'd like to be more off copy. Haven't had the time I would have liked to have had, so caveat, apology at the beginning. Um, but I'll dive straight in. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the artwork and the ideas behind it. I'm not an academic. I'm not going to pretend to approach anything with any rigour. I'm going to totally play the artist card on that one. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk more generally about the surrounding issues and why they interest me as a person and as an artist, which is kind of the same thing. So if this is a poorly structured, self-indulgent ramble entirely comprised of conjecture and opinion, I am unapologetic because luckily we then have the lovely Jason here to rescue credibility by saying proper <laughs> academic stuff. Um, so in terms of the piece, what I've tried to create is a sort of metaphor for the individual's relationship to and um, participation within global consumer capitalism. 
What I'm trying to do is seduce participants into turning the crank because they're charmed by the motion of these pleasing objects. It's fun, a desire is gratified, a little dopamine hit, if you will. Um, similarly, we feel good when we buy or consume. Um, at the same time, the participant is unknowingly part of something a lot more sinister. They're animating a wider machine. When you take a closer look, the books from which these pretty things are constructed are ideological texts um, whose ideas underpin our current economic system of extreme free market capitalism, commonly referred to now as neoliberal economics. Um, they're mostly Ayn Rand books, actually, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about her later. Um, basically, I'm fascinated by the tacit consent that we all give to our subconscious being manipulated by advertising, by PR, and shaping us into compliant consumers. Um, in essence, as an artist, I'm tricking the participant to take part in a consensual colonisation of their subconscious. So the piece kind of explores our role, particularly the grey area of consent um, as consumers. Um, so I developed it originally on a residency last year in the US and I only realised after I got there that it was a networking residency rather than a production one. So those of you who know me can imagine just how much I thrived in that environment. <laughs> um, so I pretty much hermited away doing research and I was re-watching all the old Adam Curtis movies and remembered how seeing Century of the Self when it first came out in 2002 had utterly changed my life. And I was particularly fascinated with one of the moments in time he focuses on in the early 20s when a very deliberate and arguably quite cynical decision was made to use the freshly minted ideas of Freud to manipulate us into subconsciously atta attaching desires to objects we didn't need, specifically in order to create a consumer-driven econ economy. So the title of the piece itself comes from a speech by President Hoover in 1928 to a group of men from the very new advertising and PR industries. And he said, you have taken over the job of creating desire and have transformed people into constantly moving happiness machines, machines which have become the key to economic progress. And at the time, you can understand why they'd do this. You know, I'm sure they were coming from a good place. There'd been a US depression after World War I, before the Great Depression. But in light of now, in a period that many would term late capitalism, it sounds desperately sinister. Um, there's another great quote from Lehman Brothers of all places, a guy called Paul Mazur in 1927. Uh, we must shift America from a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire, to want new things, even before the old had been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. So again, making it very clear that the intention is unashamedly to manipulate the public um, in, to the end of economic growth, essentially. Um, and I want to chuck in this other quote just because it tickles me. Um, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, coined the term public relations, saying, I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. Propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did was try to find some other words. So we found the words Council on Public Relations. Um, yeah. So at this point, I just want to give a really everyday example. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of a thing called the Gruen transfer. And it refers to the techniques used by shops, supermarkets and shopping centres to try and influence us to buy things we didn't come intending to buy. So it's about maximising unplanned sales. And the layout is designed to help us lose track of our initial intentions, making us more susceptible to impulse buys. And there's the obvious stuff like the chocolate bars at the counter or which products are on the easily reached shelves, right down to really subtle things like the music that's playing, lighting tricks and even scents. So it's all designed to buy pass our consciousness and manipulate us into buying stuff. Um, and amusingly, it's named after this Austrian architect, Victor Gruen, who like completely disowns it and hates that this stuff is named after him and says, I refuse to pay alimony for those bastard developments. <laughs> <laughs> So there's so much about our day to day experience, thousands and thousands of encounters daily with our environment around us, which is designed to manipulate us to bypass our conscious mind and rational decision making, which I think has huge ethical implications and problems with just basic consent. So even if you hate the politics and you're a hardcore Reaganomics fan, the piece itself should still hopefully make you question to what extent you are your own person, how much you are being manipulated moment to moment and how comfortable you truly are with that. And did you ever consent to that? And is your consent ongoing? Um, so the piece is ultimately about the psychology rather than the politics. Um, okay. 
So I used a range of texts in the piece, um, neocon economic stuff, a bit of Milton Friedman, but it's like 90% Ayn Rand texts. Um, I'm completely obsessed with her, or at least I'm completely obsessed with how the libertarian right is obsessed with her. Um, and if you don't know who she is, she is this kind of cult figure of the right, particularly in the US, but um, also over here. Um, and basically her philosophy is she doesn't believe in the common good, selfishness is a virtue, uh, altruism is a nation destroying evil, you'll recognise all that from Thatcher. Um, <laughs> she held that laissez-faire capitalism is the ideal economic system and that all people should relentlessly pursue their own self-interest rather than the good of others or society. Um, and she wrote these great overblown and very consciously propagandist novels to promote these ideas. Um, she coins her philosophy objectivism, if you're into the terminology, and in fact she's not a very good philosopher, which is why she's never mentioned in the canon. Um, her arguments tend not to be well reasoned or support her conclusions, so even philosophers who broadly agree with her, um, her worldview, which is ethical egoism, if you're into the jargon, um, people like Robert Nozick, who would essentially agree with her, would also say she's a pretty shit philosopher. But nevertheless, her popularity and cult status and the kind of obsessive following of her just never wanes. Um, so at this point, I kind of feel there's an extent to which I need to justify my engagement with this in a time acknowledged as late capitalism. Am I really just letting my teenage post 80s self have a whinge about something that's no longer relevant? Is it facile to talk about predatory capitalism when the actual phrase predatory capitalism is in common parlance? Um, when I started becoming obsessed with this stuff, it was the time of Francis Fukuyama declaring the end of history and then New Labour arriving as Tory light and abandoning any real opposition to neoliberal economics. It was hugely transgressive and radical at that time to suggest that this brand of capitalism was bad for people and bad for the world. So at that time, to me as a young person, I felt that something was very, very wrong with this thing called economics. It was the kind of sane person in the insane world phenomenon. It, it was a really different time. And although now I am mostly weeping for the world, there is like this little smug part of me inside saying, I told you so, I totally told you so. <laughs> like, <laughs> so although I acknowledge an adolescent part of me is still stuck in an argument that's basically happening in the late 80s, it's the wheel that was put in motion that is driving our systems now. Um, certainly Rand is going through a very mainstream moment again. Trump claims to be a fan, which is perverse because his economics are protectionist and utterly anti-Randian. Um, Paul Ryan apparently tries to force all his interns to read Atlas Shrugged. Um, Rex Tillerson, Mike Pompeo, all of those girls, love her. Um, the new tech guys, so into Rand. Um, former Uber CEO Travis Kalanick had the cover of the Fountainhead as his Twitter avatar. Um, actually, the Silicon Valley mentality is rife with Randian thinking and ultra-individualism. I'm not a big fan of the economic thinking of tech companies. I'm sure this will not surprise you. As far as I can see, disruption is just doublespeak for not paying tax and exploiting your workers. Um, I hate to break it to the young white men of tech, but people have thought of this shit before. You are not that groundbreaking. Um, so, not just in the US, but she is equally revered by her own small government fetishists. Um, apparently, Home Secretary Sajid Javid reads a particular scene in The Fountainhead twice a year. And, yeah, I know. <laughs> and Daniel Hannan, um, one of the Tory MEPs credited with backrooming a lot of Brexit stuff, keeps a photograph of Rand on his Brussels desk. So, super creepy. These people who love her, so creepy. <sighs> Um, ultimately, anyway, the right like her because she provides a sense of some moral underpinning to the greed is good philosophy. And I particularly loved how Jonathan Friedland put it. He said, Rand is Gordon Gecko with A-levels. Um, <laughs> I think it's on the nose. Um, so in truth, very little has changed since the economic crash of 2008. Um, there's still the way the economy is running, still the ideas our financial systems are predicated on, and trying to persuade humanity that curtailing wealth and growth in favour of, you know, health, happiness and actual survival of the planet is still a huge uphill battle. Um, so I'm going to whiz through uh, a quick kind of paraphrasing of, you know, where we are and how we got here. Um, from the great neocon era of the 80s came New power for corporate donors and lobbyists, we had deregulation, lower taxes on corporations, the rise of corporate raiders, junk bonds, and the unions were busted. 
The focus of CEOs shifted from stakeholder capitalism, where workers and communities are represented as well as shareholders, to purely shareholder capitalism, which is only about maximizing shareholder return. The rich get very, very rich. The middle class start to need two wage earners. The poor get poorer. Nothing trickles down. The financial crisis of 2008, deregulation leads to predator lending, the mortgage bubble, and fraud. Millions lose their jobs, savings, and homes, but banks get bailed out, nobody goes to prison. Do not get me started on this. <sighs> At the moment, the city is back to business as usual, making the rich super rich. CEOs are paid on average 300 times the average worker. One in five children in America are in poverty. So make no mistake, nothing has changed. And there is the inevitable backlash, the revolt against establishment. Um, on the one side, you get things like the Tea Party. On the other side, you get Brexit. Um, well, yeah, um, Occupy on one side. We're stuck with Brexit and Trump, all of this kind of revolt against establishment stuff. And the world system we have right now is essentially a kind of oligarchy of billionaires. Um, and I'm going to avail myself of the wisdom of the lovely Mr. Yanis Varoufakis here, because I think he puts it really perfectly when he says, at the moment, democracy is a fig leaf for oligarchy. So the next thing I'm going to do is throw a bit of a barrage of quotes at you now, because I think they encapsulate a really good description of where the world is at today. Um, I'm pretty new to public speaking, um, but I am discovering that quoting people is a great way to bask in the reflected glory of other people saying stuff <laughs> way better than I could myself. So a US justice, uh, Louis Brandeis, pointed out the obvious with respect to this kind of economic oligarchy in 1924. We can have vast wealth in the hands of a few, or we can have democracy, but we cannot have both. Um, it is interesting to me at the moment that Marx has become creeping back into the mainstream discourse as well. Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, describes how Marx predicted that the final stages of capitalism would be marked by global capital being unable to expand and generate profits at former levels. Capitalists would begin to consume the government along with the physical and social structures that sustained them. Democracy, social welfare, electoral participation, the common good and investment in public transportation, roads, bridges, utilities, industry, education, ecosystem protection and healthcare would be sacrificed to feed the mania for short-term profit. These assaults would destroy the host. You wrote it a long time ago, but I think it's pretty on the nose as far as I can see. Um, one of my favourite commentators at the moment, Umer Haik, puts it thus. The entire American economy is premised on ultra-individualistic hyper-competition, so much so that it's become predatory, antagonistic and brutalising for the lowest, most laughable kinds of material payoffs. The biggest bonus, the company Amex, the VIP table, the car service, a shiny suit and a pair of Ferragamos. And so it's devolved to hedge fund robots raiding pension funds that poor people worked hard for every day of their lives. That's not illegal, abnormal, or even ethically questionable. It's just strategy. And whilst I'm on my big quote roll, I'm going to quote someone that I would normally loathe to bring into conversation. But when even someone as extreme and disagreeably right wing as Peter Hitchens thinks this isn't working, you have to take note. I'm so sorry now that I fell for the great Thatcher Reagan promise. I believed all that stuff about privatization and free trade and the unrestrained market. Sure, some things have got cheaper and there are a lot more little treats and luxuries available. The coffee in the restaurants are better, but the essentials of life are harder to find than ever. A good life and an honest place, a solid, modest home big enough to house a small family in a peaceful, orderly landscape, good local shops open to all who need them reasonably paid secure work for this generation and the next, competent government and wise laws. These have become luxuries unattainable for millions who once took them for granted. So possibly the one and only occasion in my life that I will agree with Peter Hitchens. Um, my final and favourite little quote I'm going to pop in for describing our current way of life is this. If you could press a button that would give you a great deal of money, but it would cause someone you don't know in a distant part of the world to die, then you would have a good model for how our current economy works. And that's actually from Welcome to Night Vale for the podcast fans out there, episode 105 for the geeks. Um, so we know that trickle down doesn't work. This ridiculous idea that if we keep generating wealth for the top 1%, it will somehow be good for all of us. In the post-spirit level era, we know this is observably not the case. We devolved moral responsibility to markets, and it turns out markets aren't very moral. Who knew? 
And our governments are disempowered because they're national whilst corporations are global. Who could possibly have predicted that outsourcing public service decisions to the very consulting firms who would benefit the most would end up with wealth trickling upwards to the top whilst turning essential public services into products? Who indeed? So, having thought a bit about where we actually are now and how we got here, I want to come back briefly to Fukuyama declaring that we were in a post-ideological world and having duked it out the only man left standing of these battered old 20th century ideologies was capitalism in its most extreme form. The thing that's most interesting to me about this is the sleight of hand used that somehow convinced people that this was coming from a place of academic objectivity. Fukuyama was at this time a neocon and as much as he was presenting markets as natural and somehow Darwinian, this was an utterly ideological position, albeit one that for a good 30 years people still seem to struggle to challenge, at least in the mainstream discourse. Um, these great acts of deception performed on humanity successfully over and over in our history are something that absolutely fascinate me from like every religion ever to Brexit right now. And the sheer confidence trick, for example, of establishment millionaires like Trump and Farage convincing people that they are men of the people and, and can speak for the marginalised is breathtaking. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be blowing your mind here by admitting that I'm not a big fan of economics. I think it's a pseudoscience, only much more damaging than a bit of snake oil. By taking its theories from a theoretical to an applied place and forcing them on countries, economies are caused to collapse. People die. It makes me angry. I think maybe Jason might mention a bit about this, about how global institutions enforce neoliberal economics? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, I'm going to invoke the lovely Mr Varoufakis again as he beautifully expresses, economics is not a science, it's a religion with equations. <laughs> so many of what the bedrock theories, uh, of what were the bedrock theories of economics have been utterly discredited and the one that I'm particularly interested in is called rational choice theory which says that humans are fundamentally rational and logical and that is the basis upon which we make our day-to-day -day decisions. So much of economics is predicated on this assumption that human beings are ran fundamentally rational actors. Now, way back in the 70s, psychologists like Daniel Kahneman were challenging this and we now know from psychology that humans are riddled with huge biases and non-conscious processes play a large part in our decision-making. As Kahneman himself puts it, we are influenced by completely automatic things that we have no control over and we don't know that we're doing it. So this is really starting to get to the heart for me of what's interesting you know, to me as an artist. You know, we really do now know that most of our decision making doesn't come from a rational place, yet our forebrain continually deceives us that it is running the show, whilst actually it's all the other stuff hidden in the shadows from our consciousness that's insidiously making this decisions for us behind the scenes. Um, some of you might know of Jonathan Haidt's elephant rider analogy, a behavioural psychology model. Um, we think as the rider we're in control, but actually the elephant is pretty much going to go where it wants. Um, <laughs> we are fundamentally emotional, social, irrational creatures who deceive ourselves that we are rational. And anyway, here is one place where we encounter a really big contradiction. Uh, as we discussed earlier, consumer capitalism itself was absolutely predicated on the idea that we are non-rational actors. It's, it's predicated on Freud's ideas that we can be easily manipulated by our subconscious into buying shit. So there's this really interesting paradox and hypocrisy lying absolutely at the heart of this kind of capitalist model. It only works because we're rational actors and it only works because we're not rational actors. So is it surprising that it actually doesn't really work at all? So now I just, I'm going to sidestep briefly. I want to talk for a minute about the cult of the consumer. Um, a guy whose work I really admire at the moment is called John Alexander. He has a background in branding and advertising, but now he focuses on trying to get people to reshape their conception of themselves as citizens rather than consumers. And really specifically in terms of that language, those actual words. Uh, he runs a thing called the New Citizenship Project. And look it up, it's great. Um, he argues that consumer is not just a word, it contains an embedded moral idea, as he puts it, that our agency is limited to consumption, choosing between options offered us, and the morally right thing to do is pick the best of these for ourselves. And you can see already how creepily Randian that is. 
Um, there are experiments that actually demonstrate um, how the use of the word consumer makes us less likely to care about stuff. Um, a process that psychologists call priming is going on. And basically when we conceive of ourselves as consumers, we're priming ourselves to actually be more selfish and more short-termist in our outlook. Um, so these ideas have a huge intersection with my interest as an artist. Um, the idea that language is the very fabric of our reality, it's not a description of it, but it comprises and builds that reality itself. As Alexander puts it, it's the scaffolding on which we build our thoughts, attitudes, values and behaviours. So he points out how pernicious and dangerous the ideas we've been sold are, that we can solve the world's problems with consumerism, solve world poverty by buying stuff, that to consume is to be moral. He believes the idea of the consumer is actually killing us. And he has set about trying to reframe our very self-conception as consumers to actually being that of citizens. And this kind of brings me back to Adam Curtis, actually, who his theory is that a kind of utopian idea in the 60s that we could change the world by changing ourselves became thwarted and frustrated and kind of collapsed in on itself to become a toxic pursuit of self-expression through consumerism. And I think that's right. I think people feel so utterly powerless in the face of capitalism, which is partly why even the left succumbs to this kind of ineffective sectarianism and internal collapse into identity politics. Sticking with the idea of human frailty and the things at the centre of this for me in terms of my art practice and personal interest, I want to finally come back to Rand. I want to give you one more piece of information about her and that is her personal story. When she was 12 in St Petersburg, her family's property was confiscated in the revolution. She saw these ideals of fairness and altruism were used to tyrannise people and completely trample the rights of the individual. You know, knowing this suddenly gives incredible insight as to how she came to the conclusions she did and why she believed them and promoted them so fervently. And at that time in the US, this woman with this personal story espousing these views gave huge validation to the Red Scare era of 50s McCarthyite America. What interests me in our current era is how it is specifically that element of the personal story that has made her in some way untouchable, that sense that whatever else one might think, you can't invalidate a person's experience. And that is of course completely true, but it is a mistake to think that extends to implying that other things are also validated by an individual's experience. So as a quick aside, this is an increasingly problematic idea manifesting within the left at the moment, which is pretty much eating its own tail in this snake pit of identity politics, as versus those who are aggrieved by identity politics, seeing themselves as torchbearers of Hume and the Enlightenment, who are actually just blind to their own bi bias and deceived in the conception that subjectivity can be removed from the search for knowledge. So I'm you know, classically ambivalent in this, I'm absolutely on both sides of it. And I'm fascinated by this giant clash of these two things in the current discourse. Um, I'm hoping to do some work on it later on this year. So as a person of the left, um, I do find it fascinating this tipping point where a value system and an impulse to be kind slips into an edict and a kind of fascistic and authoritarian intolerance for those who aren't as you see it being as kind as you how what starts off as a good impulse to protect others from pain at its most fundamental level becomes a kind of tyranny that absolutely implodes the left. Um, Jonathan Haidt has an interesting theory on this about leftist witch hunts being a return to a kind of puritanism caused by the cultural homogeneity of our filter bubbles and it becomes almost like a cult where almost no level of dissent is tolerated. But that is a talk for another day. Um, so, back to human frailty, manipulation and subterfuge. Um, I'm interested in how these great, venerable, monolithic ideologies manifest as such. Um, it's a function of the human cognition that subtlety almost always gets erased in favour of simplicity or binary to facilitate categorisation by our inadequate, shorthand-seeking operating system. When it comes to socialism, clearly most people who espouse it are well-meaning. They genuinely feel the weight of inequality and the sorrows of the world and want to help things and make things better. And of course, there's then this schism between that intention and the reality of what happened historically in so-called socialist states like the former Soviet bloc and China. And the debate that almost always ensues is about whether corruption and totalitarianism are inevitable consequences of diving down a leftist rabbit hole. 
And it's boring and facile. It is a straw man that suggests that an extreme binary is your only option, that you either have neoliberal market fundamentalism or look what happens, the cautionary tale of the Soviet bloc. It's rubbish. What is much more interesting is how something that started out as ideas that were a manifestation of empathy and compassion and fundamentally good human things are so successfully subverted and inverted, how they can be used then as a sort of bogeyman and a kind of embodiment of evil for the right. How that allows something like the philosophy of Rand, something so utterly perverse, to have traction. The evils of the Soviet era are used as justification for the preposterous notion that kindness and goodness themselves are inherently evil and self-serving erotism is in fact good. Um, this just makes me think of like a ton of Orwell quotes. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. It never has it been more pertinent. So it's not unusual in this world for people who propagate evil to be mistaking that evil for the opposite. Everyone thinks they're the goody in the narrative. Um, people are blowing people up because they believe they're doing God's work. Uh, yeah, so to kind of condense that section a bit, um, what's interesting to me is how Rand, because of her personal experience, was able to twist evil into seeming good because other people who were trying to do good landed up doing evil. Uh, right, I'm going on a bit, so I'm going to cut this next section, but I have some really cool stuff on hero narrative and how the right deals with empathy and how that fits in with the kind of execrable presence of Jordan Peterson in our lives at the moment, but you can ask me about that later if you find that interesting. At the end of the day, I think there's something to be said for indigenous American activist Russell Means' contention that Marxism and capitalism are two sides of the same materialist coin. They commodify everything. Horace, way back in the day, cautions against materialism and wanting stuff for its own sake. Nothing will be enough for you because you are what you have. Thank you, Natalie Haynes, for that one. Um, I hope it's not facile to suggest that the collective endeavour of building a better world means that we need to stop obsessing about GDP and strive for happiness, health and dignity for humans and animals. Um, so hopefully in the nick of time before the rotten fruit starts to fly, I'm going to leave you with a final quote to think about. Its provenance is murky, but the truth of it always scares me. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Thanks, thanks very much indeed, Anna. There were plenty to think about there. And um, I'm sure lots of you will have questions you want to ask about that, things you want to discuss with Anna. But if you can hold that for now, because we're going to go straight on to the next speaker. I shall just um, check that this still works. It's gone off. Can you think of it? Right, OK. <laughs> Technology, eh? Who'd have it? Uh, so this is Dr. Jason Hickel, who's an academic anthropologist and author. Um, Jason's taught and researched at the University of Virginia at the London School of Economics and now Goldsmiths at the University of London. And I'll tell you something about his research because he's an academic. His academic research has focused on global inequality, political economy, post-development and ecological economics. And in particular, he's done um, a lot of ethnographic research uh, living with migrant workers in, in South Africa on migrant labour and ecological economics. And his first book, Democracy as Death, was about that. And some of his motivation uh, for working in that particular area, in that particular field, um, I imagine, stems from his upbringing in Swaziland in southern Africa, where his uh, parents were doctors. However, Jason is very much not one of those uh, academics who speaks only to other academics. Um, he's an author and an activist, and in those roles he's written extensively about his ideas, both in uh, more traditional media, such as The Guardian, um, Al Jazeera, television and so on, uh, but also in a wide range of online media. His most recent book, which was called The Divide, A Brief Guide to Global, in Global Inequality and Its Solutions, came out earlier this year. And although the ideas are grounded in his academic work and are very logical, very well explained, very well justified, it's fair to say, I think, that the book isn't aimed primarily at 
academics, it's aimed at all of us. And it describes very persuasively, in my view, how a lot of the things that we, we hear about, that we may have been led to believe about um, global poverty, about development and so on, are actually deeply misleading and in many cases simply wrong. Um, but what I like about the book in particular is it doesn't stop there. Jason goes on to tell us and make very valuable suggestions about how we might all change things. So, over to you, Jason. Ah. All right, thanks very much. And it's so good to see all of you um, on a blustery Milton Keynes night. This is my first time in Milton Keynes, and I love it so far. Um, is, everyone, is everyone brilliant and progressive, apparently, as far as I can tell? Um, <laughs> Um, that was absolutely beautiful. I really, I mean, it was like drinking from a fire hydrant of ideas. It's like everything I tried to cram down my students' throats in four years or three years, <laughs> de delivered in, in 25 beautiful minutes. It was really extraordinary. I, I was very impressed. Um, she tells me that she only spent one day working on that, which is amazing. <laughs> so um, I am uh, I'm humbled to be in the, pre in the presence of a, a better intellect than myself, for sure, and definitely a better public speaker. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to bore you. Um, so, so don't worry, I'll, tr I'll, try to, I'll try to cut it off before too long and you get back to your wine and the, and the brilliant art. Um, so uh, um, at first I was going to talk a little bit about, uh, about global inequality, how it became so extreme, what are the, some of the institutional drivers of that, and specifically the World Bank and the IMF, what role have they played in sort of generating um, that divergence and in spreading new liberal ideas around the world forcibly through structural adjustment programs during the 1980s and 1990s. I don't have time to talk about that now, um, and I'm gonna skip it in favor of something that I think is probably, uh, at least um, for, uh, for this generation, more important um, as a critique of capitalism. Um, but before I get into that, I briefly wanna talk just very briefly about art, which unfortunately I haven't had a, a real um, extensive engagement with yet, but just from my few minutes with it. Um, I, was, uh, really, I was really taken by the way that the piece um, embody, it sort of depicts capitalism as both ideology, you know, a, a series, you know, words and rhetoric and so on, um, ideas, as well as a machine. And really that does kind of, uh, it, it gets straight to the heart of what capitalism actually is, it's both. Um, and there's a brilliant term that, uh, that many Marxist philosophers have used over time uh, to describe capitalism, and that is as a juggernaut, right? A machine that sort of chews up everything in its path, and in the process of chewing things up, uh, and spewing them out actually gains more energy and moves more quickly, right? It's sort of unstoppable um, uh, consumptive force. And I think that, uh, that what's amazing about this piece is that it takes that juggernaut idea somehow, but also depicts uh, this force, this machine, um, brilliantly as, as, both as, as both frail and contrived, right? Uh, almost like a veil has been kind of suddenly pulled back and we suddenly realize that the whole thing is not natural or inevitable and unstoppable, but rather created, right? And once we realize that it's created, once we have that consciousness, um, what Marx would call conscientization, then we realize that it can be changed. Um, and I think that's what's so powerful about that piece, to me, um, at least, but uh, I'm sure there are many more ideas out there. So, the Anthropocene, uh, a, a term I assume most are familiar with these days, it's tossed around quite a lot. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about tonight is uh, is how we can survive it, because we're not on track to do so. Um, how many of you feel like we're, um, uh, at least to some extent, in a kind of serious ecological crisis right now? Just to get a sense from the room, virtually everybody. That's interesting. Um, okay, I wasn't really expecting that actually. The, the last public lecture I gave was in Harrogate, and I, I didn't know, but, uh, but the, the audience was entirely, extremely rich, retired Tories, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, <laughs> It was, it was like a setup. I'd been invited, cut, I'd been invited to speak about uh, the ravages of British colonialism. And it did not go down well. <laughs> I was really quite afraid. I mean, there were like daggers in people's eyes. <laughs> so, uh, so please, hope, I mean, hopefully it'll be kinder to me tonight. Um, so, th so this is the way I want to get into my critique of capitalism, right? Uh, and that is that at the, uh, at the very core of it, there is a single golden rule, okay? Uh, and that is the golden rule of, of growth, endless exponential GDP growth. Now what's important about this is that this is not necessarily just a kind of, um, you know, purely a capitalist uh, um, sort of piece of economics. In fact, if you think about the USSR, the USSR also, you know, an av at least avowedly communist or whatever, 
um, was, uh, was, was at least as committed to the objective of endless GDP growth as the US was during the Cold War. Um, and that remains true of China today, which is validly common sense, et cetera. So there's, the, it's, it's really not about capitalism um, so much as a deeper logic that, that underpins, uh, underpins both capitalism as well as its others, okay? Um, but it's amazing to me because the obsession with growth is something that's, um, that grips uh, our politicians on both sides of the aisle, right? So the left and the right disagree uh, vigorously about how to distribute the yields of growth. But on the question of growth itself, they're united, aren't they? I mean, uh, there's no daylight between them, okay? Um, it's something that spans the political spectrum. Uh, if, you, if you walk down the streets and question the, the objective of growth, then people will look at you like you're literally crazy, okay? Um, and that's kind of what I want to try to change a little bit tonight. So I want to think a bit about why we live in an economy that's addicted to growth. Why do we think we have to grow endlessly, exponentially every year, right? What are some of the reasons that come to your mind? Uh, because politicians pursue GDP as an indicator of progress, right? Because corporations have a fiduciary duty to shareholders to generate ever-increasing profits every year. Uh, because we need to create jobs, right? At least we believe this is the case. Okay, because we need to reduce poverty and improve people's lives, and this is the way that we're told is the best way to do that. Right? This is what the Labour Party, for example, or, or even anyone on the left, insists is the best way to, um, to improve people's lives. Right? Better jobs, reduce poverty, improve national income, etc. And because we have to pay debts. Uh, debts come with interest. Interest is an exponential function, a, a compound exponential fu uh, function. In order to pay that down, uh, every year you know, we have to uh, consume, we, we have to produce and extract more uh, just to do that, otherwise you fall into financial crisis. Because of advertising, there's sort of cultural imperatives um, behind the growth imperative, right? Uh, we're confronted by, by a complete bombardment of ads. The average person in the UK sees, what is it, uh, 3,000 ads uh, a day in terms of the brands that we see everywhere um, that, uh, that all make us feel sort of inadequate and, uh, and insecure um, and wanting. And of course, because capitalism requires it. Right? Because the definition of capital is that it has to reproduce more capital. If, if you're a capitalist and you have a stock of money and you want to call it capital, then it has to constantly grow. So you have to find ways to invest it to get more profits. If you don't, uh, then it shrinks because of inflation and that is a failure of the system. The system begins to collapse. Okay? Uh, so, right. But there's a problem, <laughs> as I'm sure you might have guessed. Um, we say right now that we need to grow the global economy by about 3% per year. Okay. This is actually written, bizarrely, into the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals passed by the UN in 2015, okay. um, which aimed to eradicate poverty and also to improve the sustainability of our ecosystems. Now this sounds normal enough to us, it sounds very small, but that's because we're used to thinking in sort of linear terms. But growth is not, it's an exponential function, right? So 3% per year. How does that multiply? It means roughly doubling a thing every 20 years. So take the size of the global economy, in the year 2000, okay? Double it for the year uh, 2020, double it again from its already doubled state by the year 2040, et cetera, et cetera. So that by, by the end of the century, the global economy would be 32 times bigger than at the beginning of the century. And by the end of the following century, it would be 1,000 times bigger, okay? I mean, this is, this is literally the objective as we speak, uh, right? And that means 1,000 times more extraction and production and consumption and waste, okay? Um, now, th the, the problem here is, of course, as you can imagine, GDP growth is very tightly linked to environmental degradation. And we're seeing this all around us right now in ways that are becoming um, very acute, okay? Uh, so here's, here's the rise of GDP over the past um, couple of hundred years. And what we see is that things really begin to take off at the birth of capitalism, uh, exponential rise, specifically after 1950, when, G when GDP uh, growth becomes a, a solid political objective. Um, for uh, the industrialized world. It's spread around the world in the 1980s, and this is the kind of rise that we see. Okay. Along with the rise of GDP, what we see is the rise of all sorts of impacts, uh, of, of consumptive Im impacts, right? Here's, the, uh, here's consumption of energy. Uh, today, of course, primarily fossil fuels. Here's uh, the consumption of water, again, rising dramatically to the point where water scarcity is something that is very serious on the horizon these days. The consumption of paper, and with it, the destruction of forests. Uh, fertilizer consumption for industrial agriculture, um, which is ravaging our soils, uh, filling it with chemicals, uh, killing off insects and uh, bird populations that depend on them, along with our pollinators. Um, scientists tell us that we have about 60 years of harvests left in our degraded soils 
as a result of 200 years of, um, of intensive industrial extraction from the, so from the land. Transportation. Uh, uh, this, is per this is millions of motor vehicles. Um, you see how that's rising, uh, showing no signs of slowing down, right? This is, this is interesting, right? Because we talk about the importance of shifting our cars over to, uh, over to, to electricity. But we don't ever talk about actually reducing the, numbers of, the number of cars that we, that we consume in the first place, right? That's not something that capitalism can deliver. Um, international tourism and the flights that, uh, that, um, that we take uh, for that pleasure. Um, and of course, carbon dioxide, the, the, the most important of greenhouse gases rising right along with GDP, very tightly coupled, at least it is right now. Methane as well, an even more potent greenhouse ga uh, gas. Ocean acidification, as we, as we fill the atmosphere with carbon, uh, the excess gets sucked into the ocean. The ocean is saving us from choking, effectively, uh, in greenhouse gases. But, um, but the consequence is that it's becoming uninhabitable for corals and all sorts of um, ocean species, leading to mass extinction in our seas, um, emptying out uh, huge parts of the oceans. Coastal nitrogen, runoff from, uh, from chemical fertilizers and pesticides used on farmland, creating massive dead zones um, along uh, the coastlines of industrialized countries. Um, where, where uh, very little life can exist. And of course, tropical forest loss. Um, scientists tell us that at, uh, at business as usual uh, uh, use of forests, um, mature tropical forests will be gone by the year 2050, right? which is a difficult fact to swallow. Um, have you seen uh, the, the, the image of the planetary boundaries framework before? Anybody? Is this familiar to anybody? A few people. This is probably the most important piece of ecological science that's been published in the past um, number of decades. Uh, scientists um, managed to figure out um, what the planetary boundaries are for key biophysical processes, like, uh, like genetic diversity, like, ha like how many species can we allow to go extinct before we start reaching dangerous tipping points where the web of life begins to, uh, begins to fall apart. Climate change. Um, uh, land system change. This is deforestation for the sake of industrial agriculture for the most part. This is phosphorus and nitrogen loading into our soils and into our water, again from runoff from industrial agriculture. Um, freshwater use here. So the, the, the green color you see is where we're in the safety zone. The yellow color is where, is where we've actually transgressed planetary boundaries. The red color is where we're beginning to trigger um, global tipping points. And this is really, um, it's, a, it's a sort of, it's an image it's a diagram of our disaster, right? Which is very difficult for us in the global north to appreciate because the disaster doesn't really affect us as much as it does in the south right now, um, with, which is where climate change and mass extinction are really beginning to bite. Okay, but you can see how we're, sort of, we're already overshooting planetary boundaries um, to a very serious extent. Um, in fact, so serious that with our present levels of global consumption, we're overshooting Earth's ecological capacity by 64% per year. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that we're extracting more than can be replenished, and we're, uh, we're wasting more than the Earth can safely absorb. Okay? If we were going to live within a single planet safely, such that the, our ecology could support us indefinitely, we would ha we'd have to reduce our annual consumption by 64% from today, okay? on a global level. What's important about this overshoot, which again is, dr is driving these, uh, this, this, um, this ecological disaster that I'm talking about, is that it's almost entirely due to overconsumption in a handful of rich nations. And this is a difficult one for us to swallow, right? Um, I, I often speak to Global South uh, audiences where uh, this is you know, well understood. But in the North, we, we try to avoid it, don't we? Um, this graph here is a graph of, uh, of material consumption per person per year in different income levels around the world, OK? So um, what we have here is uh, the number of tons per capita consumed per year. And what we have here is low income, lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income countries. Britain, of course, is a high income country. And in the year 2008, was consuming 28 tons of material stuff per person per year. A mountain of material stuff. And this is on average, of course. Richer people consume more, poor people consume less. Um, lower, low income and lower middle income countries are consuming in the region of about two to four tons of stuff per person. Dramatically less. The planetary boundary is seven. Okay. So what that means is that if everyone on, on the planet was to consume at the level that people in rich nations do, we would need the equivalent of four Earths to sustain us. Okay? And remember, this is the goal. the goal. The goal is that every country in the world should develop to the point of our levels of consumption. Right? Clearly, fundamentally, not possible. Um, 
But on the other hand, if all of us consumed like the average person in the rest of the world, outside of high-income countries, we would in fact be, be within uh, planetary boundaries on the whole. Okay? There would be no mass ecological crisis that's threatening our civilization. Okay. Um, so, what do we need to do about this situation? Well, rich countries need to do the following. Is that a sign that I need to stop? I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, they need to cut their emissions to zero by the year 2050, which implies dramatic reductions of 10% per year. Does anyone know how, how fast we're reducing emissions right now? Not at all, right? In fact, not at all. Uh, um, so, which is, um, which is a disaster. In Britain, of course, it seems like we are, but that's because we're mostly outsourcing our emissions uh, to other countries, which are producing all the stuff that we consume. And rich countries need to cut their material consumption by 75%. Get your head around that, okay? What does that mean? What does that look like? It sounds so extreme, okay? Um, so here's the million dollar question. <laughs> can, we can we do this while still at the same time growing the economy? Which remember is the key, the major public political objective of every um, country in the industrialized world, okay? Is it possible to do? What's the answer that we're normally given about this? The answer of course is yes. All we need to do is make growth green. Green growth, green growth, you hear it everywhere. The government today has a, has a plan on uh, how to create a green growth economy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the idea behind green growth is that, we have to, is that we can continue to grow GDP while nonetheless reducing resource use and carbon emissions, okay? So decoupling the two from each other, if that makes any sense. Um, and we, the, in the year 2012 is when major big reports came out about this from the World Bank, from the OECD, from the UN, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a dominant ideology that we have right now that all we need to do is make the economy green. And this, of course, is what uh, the tech billionaires are, um, are striving to uh, produce for us. So what is green growth? Very, very briefly, uh, don't worry about the technical details too much, but the basic idea is this. We need to keep GDP growing on an exponential curve, okay, but decouple impacts, right, down, back down to planetary boundaries. So relative decoupling is when we, we grow impacts but not as fast as GDP, okay, um, absolute decoupling is when we reduce impacts while GDP grows, and sufficient absolute decoupling is when we reduce uh, environmental impacts down to planetary boundaries while GDP grows. Okay, that's of course the real objective of green growth is this, sufficient absolute decoupling. So, is that possible? Uh, instead of boring you with all of the science that's come out over the past few years, I'm just going to summarize it in two quick points, and maybe you can guess what the answers are. Uh, now what's interesting is when green growth was first proposed in 2012, there was no data on whether or not it was in fact possible to achieve. Fortunately, since then, there are reams of data. And so, uh, and so I hereby announce um, the science. Uh, the first conclusion, it is physically impossible to achieve absolute decoupling of GDP from resource use over the long term. You can do it in the short term, but over the long term, the scale effect of growth uh, outstrips efficiency gains because there's a physical limit to efficiency gains. So as long as you keep growing, once you've reached the limits of efficiency gains, you drive consumption back up, okay? Physically impossible. In a zero growth economy or a degrowth economy, then you can do it. It is possible to achieve absolute decoupling of GDP from CO2 emissions, but not at a rate that's fast, en that's fast enough to keep us from blowing the carbon budget for two degrees Celsius, okay? If we had 100 years to solve the climate change problem, then yes, we have 19, okay? Uh, at our present rates um, of emissions before we blow the ceiling for two degrees. Okay. Um, so there's no way that we can do it fast enough for that in the context of an exponentially growing economy. Um, it sounds all very technical, but these are very sobering words because it effectively means that um, our economic system is fundamentally incompatible with the long-term survival of our civilization um, on, a, on a planet of, uh, of uh, limited ecology. Now, this does not mean that technological innovation isn't vital. Of course it is. We have to improve the efficiency of virtually everything we do. We need electric cars. We need solar panels. We need wind power. We need um, uh, to invest everything we have into renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. The point is this, that in a context of continued economic growth, that alone will not be enough, okay? Um, we can't just uh, um, rely on wizardry to do it because the, mo the models that scientists are using to come, with, to come up with these conclusions presuppose rapid levels of technological innovation, presuppose rapid levels of, um, 
of, of increase on carbon taxes and resource extraction taxes, and still the results remain the same. Okay. Um, this image by artist Joan Wong, to me, is a beautiful one. Um, it, it really captures a key dilemma that we face here, right? And that is this. Even if somehow we say, let's just imagine somehow, Elon Musk or whatever, uh, comes up with a, with, with a perfectly clean and fully renewable, impact-free form of energy, and we can switch our entire economic system over to it tomorrow, right? Let's say it's, uh, you know, space energy. I don't know. Um, that wouldn't actually solve our problem, okay? It might slow down global warming significantly, for sure, but it doesn't deal with the fact that, um, that really the, 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 the base logic that's driving ecological collapse is the growth imperative. What would we use that free, uh, clean energy for but to cut down more trees, to, tr to trawl more fish, right? To, to intensify our extraction from the land, to produce and consume more stuff, because that is the imperative of our economy. So green growth is not a thing, right? Uh, our only option, in fact, is for rich countries to scale down their aggregate economic activity. That doesn't mean that everybody needs to scale down what they consume, but on the whole, rich countries need to do this, okay? Um, now, so this is what we call degrowth, and it's an idea that's gaining traction these days. I might, I might even say growing <laughs> in academia and activist circles, and it's quite an important one, but, but it's very important that I distinguish it from uh, um, a very pernicious idea, and that is of, aus of austerity, right? When people hear degrowth, they think that sounds just like austerity. You're basically David Cameron. Uh, and I say, uh, I'm much better looking, but <laughs> actually, I don't think I am. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so degrowth is not the same as austerity, um, because if you think about austerity, what is the purpose of austerity? The purpose of austerity is to cut social spending, to cut wages, um, to cut regulations, et cetera, et cetera, so as to do what? Improve growth, right? That is the objective. In fact, austerity is precisely a sign, it's precisely the symptom of our addiction to growth. Degrowth is completely the opposite. The idea of degrowth is to invest in social, in, in social services, invest in the commons, invest in equality, so as to render growth unnecessary. It's exactly the opposite, right? Degrowth does not mean immiseration. And I can prove this to you with three quick facts, which to me are extraordinary every time I talk about them. We can improve human well-being while in fact reducing material consumption. And we know that because of this. Take the United States, um, a, a nation of, of, let's be honest, mass, egregious overconsumption. Um, in 1975, US, uh, US GDP per capita was 50% lower than it is today, half of what it is today. And yet they had higher happiness levels, higher wages, and a lower poverty rate. How do you think that's possible? Anybody? It seems, yeah. What's that? Investing in the right things. Yeah, basically, basically so. They, they, they distributed aggregate income more fairly, okay? And so despite having much less uh, income than, than we do today, than they do today, they were much better off, okay? Take, take Europe as compared to the US. Europe's GDP per capita today is 40% less than that in the US. And yet Europe has better social indicators across the board. Better education, better health, better longevity, better espresso, better plazas and cathedrals. <laughs> Right? Um, right? Uh, take Costa Rica. Costa Rica's GDP per capita is one-fifth that of the U.S. And yet they have higher happiness in the U.S. and higher life expectancy, okay? Because they've invested in one of the best uh, health and education infrastructures um, in the world, free at the point of use. Okay. Here's the U.K. I don't know if you can see. Okay, you can. Um, U.K. GDP has nearly doubled since, since the 1970s. Okay, and yet, during that period of a doubling in our, in our average income, life satisfaction has stagnated and even declined, right? What is the point of all of this growth if it's not actually making us uh, better off, happier and, uh, and, and richer in our well-being? So the question is, how do we get there? What, is an, what, what does a degrowing economy look like? How do we make that work? It sounds like a disaster. Um, before I get into that, briefly, I just want to say, this is not just about changing your personal behavior, okay? Of course, I mean, you know, uh, you need to, whatever, compost and, uh, and uh, not drive as much and not fly as much, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea of just going back to your own private flats and worrying about your own personal behavior is a very neoliberal concept, right? In fact, derives from the very system that is driving us to this crisis in the first place. What we need to do is reach out um, across the walls of our flats, um, connect with each other, organize to create 
uh, a new economic system that does not require endless growth, okay? that can deliver flourishing without growth. So the question becomes, how do we liberate ourselves from the growth imperative? We have to ask, again, why is our system addicted to growth, like we talked about before? Okay? Th th think about those imperatives um, and how they drive our system. And think about then how we can change those imperatives, liberate ourselves from them. We can change the way that we measure progress, shifting from an obsession with GDP um, to a more accurate measure of well-being, one that takes, uh, takes account of the ecological costs of growth and the social costs of growth. Right? Uh, the genuine progress indicator takes GDP and subtracts negatives, social and ecological negatives. If our politicians pursued GPI instead of G GDP, they'd be incentivized to increase social goods while reducing ecological bads. That's an easy way we could make a change. We can change shareholder, val uh, shareholder value rules um, so that corporations are not bound by law to deliver profits to shareholders. They can do other kinds of things. So that once uh, um, an ironing board company has sold everybody an ironing board, it doesn't need to keep increasing ironing board sales year on year uh, by pumping you full of advertising for ironing boards. Right? Um, a fair distribution of existing resources. What might that look like? Um, uh, our politicians tell us now that, uh, and, and they literally say this, growth, on the right, growth is a substitute for equality. Right? It's easier for us to imagine growing the pie than redistributing what we already have, because that pisses people off who are rich. Right? But if that is the truth, if growth is a substitute for equality, they say, we can flip that equation around, and we can say that equality can be a substitute for growth. Right? Um, if we redistribute what we already have, we don't need to plunder the earth for more. What does that look like? Maybe it looks like um, fair wages. Okay? Maybe it looks like uh, restoring the commons. Th you know, if, if you think about the US, for example, the um, US has a uh, private education and private healthcare system. Okay? Enormously expensive. Uh, if that were socialized, commonized, restored as a commons, then Americans could theoretically work significantly less, earn significantly less, with no reduction to their quality of life. Okay. The more that we can reclaim commons in our, in our world, uh, the less income we need to live well. Okay. Um, it's, it's a demand for abundance rather than scarcity, which is interesting. Maybe a basic income. We won't go into that now. Debt. We have to deal with a, with a debt driver of, of economic growth. We can talk about debt jubilee. We can get together and decide what debts we think don't need to be paid, because debts, in fact, do not need to be paid. If you don't pay a debt, nobody dies. Right? If you do pay a debt and have to grow in order to do it, then the ecology gets destroyed. Uh, so we need to have a reckoning with the question of debt. We need to solve the productivity trap. Right now, capitalism has, has built into it um, a requirement to always increase productivity. Right? That's something that everyone is basically aware of. But as productivity increases, you need fewer workers to do the same amount of work. And so what happens to them? They get, they get ejected from the system, and you end up with a bunch of unemployed people. And then what do you have to do with unemployed people to make sure they survive? You have to grow more to create more jobs and suck them back up into the system, right? So the productivity trap um, generates a need for growth. How do you solve that problem? A shorter working week, for example, right? Shorten the working week, uh, redistribute necessary labor so everyone has access to a job for income to survive and live well without the necessity of creating more jobs um, to mob up unemployment, okay? Um, we could ban advertising in, in public spaces. Uh, Sao Paulo, one of the biggest cities in the world, has done this. It's not a crazy idea, right? What was the result? Happier people. People that don't feel the need to consume as much to feel good about themselves. Um, particularly women, interestingly enough. So why not you, you know, do that in Milton Keynes or in London? Um, ultimately, a steady state economy. Um, this is an important concept developed by ecologists, um, specifically a, a man named Herman Daly. And the principle is this, with resources, use them no faster than they can be regenerated. Okay? And with waste, generate it no faster than it can be safely reabsorbed by the earth. Okay? These are the principles of a steady state, of a steady state economy. Um, and we can bring ourselves in, in that direction. But we have to be uh, mindful of the facts that while that sounds quite nice, the reality is that such an economy, a degrowth economy, a steady state economy, let's be honest, is not, in fact, compatible with capitalism. Right? And what that means is that we have to evolve, in the 21st century, evolve beyond capitalism to something better. Right? Not reaching back to the past for some failed experiments, but using our innovation, using our creativity, using our intimacy to build uh, a better system for ourselves. Right? Now, what's interesting is that um, 
we are a culture completely obsessed with innovation, aren't we? I mean, the tech billionaires, for example. Um, when is the last time you saw a smartphone or a computer and said, this is the best smartphone that will ever be created and will never be surpassed and we should never even try, right? I mean, to say such a thing would be absolutely ludicrous. We know that we're more creative than that. So why is it that when it comes to capitalism, we, 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 sort of, we shrink from that challenge, we abandon the, the, the very notion of innovation, and we believe that somehow it's the best and only system that will ever exist, right? So we need to call on each other to uh, be more courageous, to reach out across our isolation and, uh, and build a system that is more intimate, more resilient, uh, safer, and more just. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. But before you do that, Anna wanted to say a few final I words. Did, I just want to say like a few thank yous very quickly. Obviously, to our incredible headline act this evening. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, to Kevin for agreeing as a bit of a favour to me to chair and for massively bigging me up. Good one. <laughs> um, to all my wonderful volunteers who have helped me tonight, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And to the library staff and Michelle for being so welcoming and hostly to this whole thing. It's been lovely. Um, to my friend Hilly and my friend Michael for just keeping me sane this summer. And um, finally, to my engineer Clive, who I can't see right now, but who makes the magic happen. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, so do, do stay around in the foyer and the events room over there. Thanks very much.